the topic, the convergence of environmental justice and rights, our speaker is Mr. James R. May. Mr. May is the Director of Global Environmental and Natural Resources Law Institute in Washington. He's a lawyer and a distinguished professor of law, founder of the Global Environmental Rights Institute, a co-founder of the Dignity Rights Project and the Environmental Rights Institute at Widener University Delaware Law School. May serves as the special representative on environmental and nature rights for the International Council of Environmental Law, the Global Pandemic Network, the World Commission on Environmental Law, and the Normandy Chair for Peace. We have three reactors on Mr. May's topic. From Mindanao, we have Mr. Chito Yu Trillanes, coordinator of Ecology Ministry Diocese of Tandag. He is a graduate of Bachelor of Laws at San Sebastian Institute of Law, a human rights defender, and an environment activist. He is a member of the Council of Elders of Alianza Tigil Mina. He attended the training of trainers on improving forest governance in the Philippines during the 7th Dublin Platform, Dublin, Ireland. Attended the Center for International Development Training mining audit. For Luzon, we have Anton Antonio, Managing Director of the Integrated Forest Management Association of the Philippines. Mr. Antonio has a master's degree in environment and natural resources management from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, Laguna. A member of the National Governing Board of the Philippine Sustainable Forest Certification. He was a resource speaker on the topic, International Forum of Sustainable Forest Products Industry at Nanning, China in 2018 and 2019. Speaker during the Wood Summit of DNR Forest Management Bureau in 2018. From Mekong, we have On Hyuan Sayasi. On has a master's degree in international development focusing on livelihoods adaptation, rural development and settlement in Lao PDR. He is currently the program manager of Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade based in Venshan, Laos, working on water, energy and climate in the mainland Southeast Asia. He engages in the governments in the region, the Mekong River Commission, private sector representatives, civil society, and research institutions to strengthen governance of the region's waterways. Onhiwan believes that effective water resources management is critical to sustainable, equitable, social, and economic development. Mr. May, you now have the floor. Included in that document. And after a long battle, it was just mentioned in the preamble. It's not enforceable. And there's no mention of a right to a healthy environment at the international level. We do see it at the regional level, uh, including in, uh, in, in most regional agreements, the, uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, among them, the Arab Charter, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, and the South San Salvador Protocol. So these are regional agreements about human rights. Uh, uh, all around the globe, and most of them recognize the right to a healthy environment. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights is a notable exception to that. And then there are procedural rights that have emerged uh, that are reflected in the Aarhus Convention and the Eskazu Agreement. These are agreements that recognize everyone's right to a healthy environment as a means for getting information and participating in decisions that affect the environment. So here's where things go in a different direction. Um, there are 193 still UN recognized countries. You know, if Ukraine falls, then there will be 192. But uh, of those, about 84 have a constitutional recognition of a right to a healthy environment, including Philippines, as you know. Uh, 
Uh, many of these provisions are, are, are simple, you know, a direct positive right. Like uh, my example here is Angola is the first one. But if you look down, I have the Philippines that the state shall protect and advance the right of the people to a balanced and healthful ecology in accord with the rhythm and harmony of nature. This Article 2, Section 16 provision that again has come out in some of the most consequential jurisprudence on the planet about a right to a healthy environment. There are more elaborate provisions. The leading examples are from Brazil and South Africa. And elaboration doesn't mean implementation. Um, but there are more nuanced uh, takes on a right to a healthy environment. So those are just examples of provisions. And what we see globally is a lot of the globe, uh, countries from around the globe, recognize a right to a healthy environment in one way or another. Not so much in North America, as you can see, right? But, but everywhere else, uh, we, we see a lot of green, a lot of greening of constitutions. And these are all the places where there's an express substantive right a right that's a positive right to a healthy environment, these 84 countries and other subnational entities from all around the globe. Courts are involved too. Uh, some of the leading cases, in addition to Miners Oposa and the Manila Bay case and others, come from uh, South Africa uh, and at the subnational level, at the state level, the United States, from primarily from uh, the state of Pennsylvania. But that's not all. Um, there's a lot of jurisprudence uh, finding that there is an implied right to a healthy environment uh, that's implied and incorporated into a right to life or dignity or family and health. So even in countries like India, Bangladesh, and Nepal that don't have, don't recognize a right to a healthy environment in their constitutions, they do recognize the right to life. Courts in those countries have, in, have found that the right to life, again, for example, or dignity, or family incorporates a right to a healthy environment. So there aren't that many cases, however, uh, not many you know lawsuits that have been brought. Uh, that is, uh, by my count, uh, in 50 years there are less than 100 uh, cases that have been decided by courts involving a, a substantive right to a healthy environment. That's not that many. You know, that's only about an average of one case per country uh, over 50 years. So why is that? Well, it, it, some of that has to, it links back to the environmental justice movement as well. These cases are hard. You know, bringing human rights-based claims is difficult. It takes a lot of expertise, a lot of energy, and a lot of time, and a lot of resources that you can't get back. Um, and many of these provisions aren't self-executing. By my count, about half of them can't be enforced in a court of law. And even if they can, there are difficulties of proceeding uh, with, with litigation. Now, the, in the Philippines, for example, there are special procedural rules that um, make an end run around some of these obstacles to enforcing environmental rights. But that stands as uh, an outlier uh, to the global um, trend, the global um, uh, obstacles that are put in, in front of enforcing environmental rights. So there's a question about whether legal recognition improves environmental outcomes. You know, what we see is that there's evidence that recognizing a right to a healthy environment, but it's really thin. So there's more work to be done there uh, to, uh, to demonstrate that uh, a right to a healthy environment, uh, uh, you know, makes a difference uh, in the, you know, uh, in the, in the lives of, uh, of, you know, of human beings throughout the planet. So this again is all the provisions, all the countries that recognize a right to a healthy environment. But when we compare that to environmental outcomes, uh, uh, this is a, a Yale, um, uh, you know, the, the the university and the law school in the United States uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. It, anyway, it, it has a project where it evaluates environmental progress. It's called uh, perf an environmental performance index, and what we see is that. When we compare those two, um, you know this this depiction, where with all this green, but when we compare it to this, the countries that are in blue have stronger environmental performance indices. There there are better results. It doesn't mean the results are great. It just means they're better overall. Looking at air pollution, water pollution, biodiversity protection, and some other inputs, and so we see almost an opposite, an X-ray of that there.
So that, that warrants further study, especially in the context of environmental justice. So lastly, what's new? Uh, well, there's there continues to be conversations about whether there should be international recognition of environmental justice, you know, through a right to a healthy environment. Either, you know, just including just last week with the United Nations Environment Assembly in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, then this summer um, before the United Nations General Assembly. Recently, the European Convention on Human Rights is being looked at um, uh, to, or there's considerations to amend that to recognize a right to a healthy environment. Uh, nationally, there are more and more cases, including in the United States and elsewhere. And also subnationally in the United States, there's more and more of a movement to recognize uh, a right to a healthy environment. And with that, um, justice. So here's the Human Rights Council resolution from just a few months ago, just last October, the UN Human Rights Council recognized uh, a right to a healthy environment, it issued a resolution that affirms that the promotion of the human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So that's from Geneva, that's from United Nations, the, the, the human rights uh, portion of the United Nations that operates out of Geneva. Uh, most countries on the Human Rights Council um, were in favor of it. There are 47 member states in the Human Rights Council, 43 voted in favor um, of this resolution, and uh, four countries abstained, including Russia. Um, then there's movement for, like I said, for the European Convention to consider it. And then uh, it's under consideration uh, in many states in the United States, in, uh, including in the state of Maryland. New York recently uh, adopted a right to a healthy environment. New York State did uh, under its constitution. And then this is the last slide with closing statements from, 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 from judges in the United States who are trying to do what they can to um, again, recognize human dignity and promote fairness uh, in court cases, um, including in the context of uh, of um, uh, water, uh, drinking water contamination in Flint, Michigan, for example, if you've heard of that, or elsewhere around the country. And the bottom line is uh, what Robert Bullard, who many um, call the, a, a parent to environment, the environmental justice movement, he said, really, it's all about wanting a healthy, livable environment. And so that, in closing, is the convergence of environmental justice, environmental rights. So I very much appreciate your time and look forward to the reactor's responses. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. James Army. Indeed, that was full of wisdom. To all our online participants. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you again. Um, uh, I spent considerable time in the Philippines in 2015 and 16. And it's just great to, to be a part of this. And it's an honor to be a part of a forum on environmental justice. Um, let me thank uh, the uh, um, Adad, uh, Badad uh, Institute, the US Embassy, and my friends, uh, Nina and Neil. And I look forward to hearing the remarks from uh, the reactors. So um, I'm wondering if I can share the screen or if the, the screen can be shared with me um, or if there's another way to, to um, work through my slides, great, thank you. That's perfect. So just give me a thumbs up. Uh, can you see the screen? Okay, thank you, I got the thumbs up. And, um, and the, uh, I take it the audio is okay too, but please let me know otherwise. Um, so I'm going to talk about environmental justice and how it emerged and how it's converging with something else uh, that's sort of new to environmental lexicon called environmental rights. Now, for many, if not most, if not all of you, um, you know about environmental rights because some of the um, leading jurisprudence and thinking on environmental rights, of course, comes from the Philippines uh, with the Miners of Posa case, for example, the Manila Bay case, and then also with the um, uh, the Human Rights Commission's consideration of uh, dignity and carbon majors. Well, there's a convergence with environmental justice. So my purpose is just to talk about those two streams flowing into each other. One is environmental justice, and the other is 
environmental rights. Uh, so, so first on environmental justice. So there are lots of definitions of environmental justice all around the globe, including in the Philippines. Uh, in the United States, it's uh, generally defined as really just treating people with dignity, with fairness. But it's this first definition from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. That's the most commonly used definition of environmental justice, that it's the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income. So that's kind of a basic, um, the, the floor of environmental justice. Well, really what it's about is again, treating people with dignity and with fairness. And environmental policies, uh, oftentimes, because of um, colonialism, um, because of elitism, be because of white supremacy, because of a whole variety of factors, can often have a disproportionate effect upon certain communities called environmental justice communities. And in the United States, uh, that's been uh, known since, well, for uh, um, almost 50 years now, since 1971. And um, just study after study in the United States, beginning in the 1970s and 80s and carrying through uh, to 2022, have shown that race is a controlling factor in like, for example, forecasting where toxic waste landfills go. And the COVID-19 um, pandemic just exacerbated, made worse those conditions. Uh, and study after study shows that as well, meaning that so-called environmental justice communities, you know, the, the, the vulnerable in the United States, people of color, um, the poor, are way more likely to be um, victimized by increased environmental pollution. And they're also way more likely to be, or more likely to be um, afflicted by COVID because uh, environmental stressors can exacerbate health impacts, including of COVID. So a few things about trends, this is the growth of environment, the environmental justice movement um, in the United States and its convergence with environmental justice uh, movements all around the globe. Well, arguably, the beginning of the environmental justice movement was the day before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you know, the United States uh, civil rights advocate, was murdered in Memphis, Tennessee, because he was there to, uh, or, uh, to speak on behalf of sanitation workers. He was there on behalf of the working class of communities of color regarding environmental impacts. And then a few years after that, the uh, federal government in the United States acknowledged that racial discrimination uh, is occurring. Um, and we see that in study after study in the 1980s and so on, um, through all throughout the country, um, including in North Carolina, including in most states in the southeastern part of the United States, including California, just all over. So that continued over the next decade with um, other uh, studies and findings uh, about the disproportionate effects of environmental pollution uh, affecting um, uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, affecting uh, Native Americans, just uh, every minority group in the United States was more subject to increased environmental pollution. So the idea of environmental justice is to do something about that. Uh, and in 1993, uh, the federal government established the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council called NEJAC. That's that very last bullet point on the slide. And that was like, like the first step of trying to establish a commission on environmental justice. And then the next year, our president, President William Clinton, at the time, uh, signed what's called an executive order, which is something that... Um, uh, 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 has federal agencies comply with a uh, presidential proclamation, if you want to think of it that way. And, and that was to take into account the disproportionately high and adverse human effects of environmental policies. Now that continued to grow apace until fairly recently, uh, because when Donald Trump was elected president in 2016, or became president, uh, he, he and his administration 
dismantled environmental justice programs. Um, as we heard Nina Lewis mention, the Biden, the Biden administration, the Joseph R. Biden administration has reversed many of those actions. Uh, but we lost a good five years uh, of environmental justice progress during the Trump administration. The Trump administration uh, called the environmental justice uh, movement part of an anti-American uh, propaganda. Uh, but there's another side, as there is, in, as there are you know, as in the Philippines and the United States and all over the globe. Uh, there uh, have been efforts at the federal level to uh, pass a law to provide a private cause of action. It's called but a, a way of, of bringing a lawsuit against the government to have it be more fair and take dignity into account in environmental uh, planning is the bottom line on that. And then also, as, um, uh, as Nina Lewis intimated, there are these trends at the federal executive level uh, in the United States of a recommitment to environmental justice. For example, the Biden administration has established an environmental justice executive advisory committee. These are people who report uh, to the president about environmental justice matters. Uh, the Biden administration also uh, reanimated the, the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, that NEJAC group that President Trump had um, uh, had undone. He put it back together again. Uh, and then there are executive orders that the Biden administration has issued that take into account environmental justice in uh, issues involving climate change and supply chains uh, and other matters. So the idea is to take environmental justice into account throughout the whole of government, uh, even in decisions that don't necessarily involve the environment, but take into account socioeconomic and cultural uh, consequences of uh, decisions by the federal government. Uh, one example is the, of that is the is what's called this Federal uh, Justice 40 program, and that's to have 40% of all the overall benefits of federal investments in climate and clean energy go to environmental justice communities. Uh, the president has also made other key uh, appointments uh, to promote environmental justice uh, throughout his administration. So it's, it's fair to say that environmental justice is a priority. It's not probably at the top of the list, but it's a priority item for the Biden administration. On the other hand, right, there's on the other hand, is that there are conversations all around the globe about ways to advance environmental justice and environmental rights. There's more progress that can be made, and it's being made at the state level in, in the United States, you know, the, the so-called subnational level. Uh, along the Mekong, in seven Mekong province. The Mekong uh, issue uh, is very complex and dynamic and uh, transboundary problem and it's new uh, issue for us. So local community and uh, uh, civil society across the border in the Mekong, uh, especially the local Mekong country. We have, and also, even though the, the local authority or the government, we don't have uh, enough knowledge uh, to deal with the problem, to solve the problem effectively. Uh, for example, in, in the past, the uh, Thai civil society uh, movement on the, the water or dam or water resource management issue in Thailand, uh, we work mostly uh, uh, about the uh, dam development in Thailand and the uh, uh, actor or uh, the owner of the dam is Thai government. But uh, for the Mekong issue, the dam or the water development project, uh, a big large scale project in the Mekong, uh, we have to learn about new actor, which is the uh, not only the government, but also the business actor, and not only in Thailand, but also in the, from different country, we have to learn about how to deal with the uh, uh, government from other country, which is complex and issue, and this is a new uh, problem. Uh, and more than that, the problem, the impact of the chain of the Mekong in 
in in the lower world, Mekong country is uh, complex and it's new and uh, it's very big uh, problem. It's and it's not happened only in uh, one or two village or two uh, province, but it's across and related uh, across the border. So yeah, may I can I uh, share? Okay, I can share my screen. Yeah, as you know that uh, this is uh, some example, the Mekong country yeah, is very important ecosystem. It's one uh, international, we will run to three country. Yeah, if uh, important resort for water and uh, also the fish. And you see, as you may know that with 1,000 or 1,700 fish species and there yeah, are many, endangered species and it's very, very important uh, resort for food for local community. Uh, not only fish, but also make a river bank gardens. And the main problem is the dam. The first part is the upper Mekong dam. The upper Mekong is in China. Uh, 12 dam is finished already. And maybe I think maybe ten or twenty more we plan to build. And in China is in uh, uh, China territory we cannot do anything. And China is not part of the Mekong River Commission, so uh, we cannot negotiate and talk with China. And in the lower Mekong, you can see that uh, twelve dam is planned to build eleven, but two is fish are finished already. And uh, in Laos. Uh, the first dam is built already, it's built by Thai company, Thai private company, and 95% uh, uh, of the electricity export, export to Thailand. But Thailand, we have already enough uh, electricity, it's more than enough. We have about 50%, uh, so more than enough, more than we want. Yeah, the reason is, the question is why we need to build and import the electricity. So it caused a, a lot of impact to local community, River Bank Garden. And you can see that uh, this just happened last year or two years ago. Is the Mekong is turned blue in the past, in the history life of uh, local Mekong, local people, we never see this before. The Mekong blue is Mek or Mekong because hungry river, which means that the river, when the river is no sediment and it caused a lot of impact to and it's some impact. Uh, so what we can do um, because of the, the problem is so uh, complex and transboundary. Yeah. So we have to start from the local movement, uh, national uh, movement. We do many protests uh, and yeah, it's transboundary issue. We can across the border uh, in the country. Sometimes we have to do in, uh, in, in Thailand side or on the Mekong. This picture, we do the protest in the Mekong, but we have to be uh, close to uh, Thailand's uh, border. Uh, we do uh, different protests against the uh, uh, bank, uh, private company, which is we don't know how to deal with them. Yeah, we build a network uh, in Thailand, national network and yeah, international uh, regional network. And not just only about uh, we try uh, we do the the legal action, but the limitation is that uh, because the the legal or the law is protect uh, it, the problem is that we cannot do across the border. And uh, not just only the dams, but also also other different different development project. For example, this uh, a project to to make the Mekong as the, the channel for uh, navigation of the uh, Mekong commercial ship from China to Laos. So they have to remove the rock rapid and island. So we have to do uh, protest, do everything uh, against the project, but yeah, we cannot do across the border. Uh, this is a picture that we uh, do the protest against the, the, the survey ship of the China, China a Chinese company to survey uh, for the project for this uh, Mekong navigation event project. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, I think this is uh, my last slide. Yeah. So the problem in Mexico is yeah is com complex issue and yeah to learn we have to work across the border and yeah the cooperation yeah, and it's new problem and it's caused a lot of impact to uh, civil society and the environment in the Mekong. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Thoughts on environmental justice. And for me, it's always been about two things. One is um, with regards to the benefit. So, you know, we have to ask the question, is um, distribution of environmental benefits? Is it benefiting local communities, you know, marginalized groups, women, those who are affected by climate change, for example, like um, farmers and fisher folk. And then there's also the responsibility side. So there's also environmental justice in the sense um, of are uh, all stakeholders uh, being, you know, given a voice and are able to uh, hold space in the decision-making table when it comes to designing, developing, and implementing um, environmental projects. So in my experience, um, you know, a lot of what uh, Christy shared uh, with regards to environmental justice and discrimination is also resonates very much with my own experience in Luzon and in the Visayas. And, and you know, there are many uh, areas where injustice happens, but uh, I'd like to just touch on a few. One is uh, on land appropriation or tenure, which uh, I, the first panelist also spoke about. But in the Philippines, as you all know, we're an archipelago. So we also have um, issues regarding, you know, claims uh, and disputes with regards to water areas or boundaries. Um, then, of course, we have land and also water-based uh, resource extra extraction. So what Christy shared about mining, but we also have uh, similar issues with regards to fishing grounds, for example. Um, and lastly, um, I think another important area is uh, pollution and waste management. And I feel there's also injustice that is happening in that area. So lots of challenges on the ground, but I want to speak a little bit to some of the lessons that uh, Christy mentioned in her presentation. And the first actually is on impact is first local before global. So this is also very true in my experience. If you can see the map behind me, this is Denhugan Island. This is the marine sanctuary that um, the foundation that I'm part of is protecting. And you know, in the 1970s and 80s, there was a big mining operation in the mainland. And this of course affected the, the reefs that are surrounding uh, both the island and in the mainland. But you know, even after the mine was closed, we still felt the impact. Why is this? Because when the mines closed, a lot of, um, explosives were just left behind and suddenly the fisher folk had access to free free explosives that they were using for dynamite fishing so this is actually what triggered um, the purchase of the island by our foundation because we really wanted to protect the area um, also uh, you know we recognize that um, you know, our ecosystems are, are interconnected. So when we are designing projects, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, I was involved in a project. Uh, we were looking at the Bataan, key biodiversity areas in the terrestrial area. But then we know that the, our protection and even economic related work so it's important also that um, when we're designing these projects um, that we look at the impact to, uh, for Bata, for example, the flow would be to Manila Bay. And we know that there are already a lot of uh, issues and concerns uh, with the uh, rehabilitation of Manila Bay. Another point that was shared was about tenure policy uh, gains not being static and how uh, legal remedy has also hit its limitations. So I also agree with this, uh, Christy. So in, our, in the Philippines, I'm sure all of us are aware about the claim and dispute with the West Philippine Seas and uh, lots of developments here. But I, I agree with, with some of the statements on how there's a need for regional cooperation in, um, in, in the ASEAN. And, uh, and because we do have common concerns like fisheries management and law enforcement, and I feel this can be better addressed at the regional level. And also, um, 
in the also recognizing that in the meantime, you know, our local fisher folk communities, they are their lives and livelihoods are affected. So we also need some kind of intervention to, you know, also immediately immediately respond to their needs. Um, the third point I want to raise is the role of women or women taking the lead in environmental protection. So wishing everybody today a happy International Women's Day. I don't know if you forgot, but it is International Women's Day. So um, in Negros, uh, in, the, in the area of pollution management or plastic pollution, we are working with um, small micro-medium enterprises in trying to make their practices more zero waste or plastic free. So in Negros, we call this the Wala Usik movement. Wala Usik in Hiligay non means nothing goes to waste. And uh, that is what we are promoting. And we are also work working with women waste workers and trying to promote shared responsibilities in waste management. Um, and this is giving justice again to uh, our women and men, um, informal waste workers who, who are impor um, providing important um, frontline services to the community and to the environment. And finally, the fourth uh, lesson that I wanted to also um, mention is um, the lesson on the need for education and building the next generation of leaders and activists. So in the Nugan Island, uh, it was mentioned earlier when I was introduced that we are conducting these marine and wildlife camps. These camps have inspired young uh, people to become, you know, environmental lawyers, become marine biologists, and pursue courses in agriculture and fisheries. And I feel this is also part of, um, you know, justice for the youth or justice for the next generation. So finally, um, beyond, you know, beyond humans, uh, I want to also re-echo what... Um, somebody said in the first uh, panel is that we also need to look at uh, the other life on the planet, uh, you know, and we're not the only inhabitants of the planet. So it's also about ecological unity and um, species inter interdependence. And in, in Philippine Reef, you know, our vision actually is wildlife and people in harmony for a sustainable future. And that is something I hope um, all of us can, can practice in our own unique ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Sef Karendang, for that very wonderful against this giant, even its own government. St stories like this abound, even in my experience in research and development work among the indigenous communities in Mindanao. And um, we have uh, very much parallel experiences. As a graduate student, as a part time faculty of the Department of Sociology in Xavier, I became a volunteer for several years working for a development program among the Matig Salog Manobin San Fernando Bukidnon. And my volunteerism was an offshoot of my exposure to the area as I was doing my thesis on child rearing practices. Uh, the community was situated in a valley where two rivers converge and form a tributary that exists in the Salog River. The community is in fact an open space formation brought about by the flooding of the rivers. The people used to live in the mountains surrounding the valley, but since a high school was built there for their children, a good number decided to live there as well. It is quite noticeable that the mountain surrounding the valley was bare, save for the abundance of cogon grass and some plots planted with corn. A big tree stands in the middle of the community with few others nearby. Otherwise, the place was simply bare. While doing my thesis, it was narrated that the area used to be a forest in the 70s, but when a logging concession entered, everything was gone. Some recall the horrifying creaking and howling of a machine stationed in the hills overlooking the glen, equipped with cables tied to the trees, uprooting and dragging them uphill till there was none left. The same story is narrated in other indigenous communities in Mindanao. In Surigao, the Mamanwa suffered the same fate. Owing to the rich mineral deposits of their lands, mining activities have transformed the once majestic landscape into a flattened piece of land, their resource base, carried in large trucks that transport them into ships out of the country to where the ores will be processed. The remnants carried by the river into the sea, killing the marine resources they have. This is also true to other ancestral domains in Caraga, where forests above were logged over, after which the minerals below were dug and exploited. The Manobo and the Banwaon, for example, were never spared from such commercially driven environmental catastrophe. All this for a meager 1% royalty. Some of the indigenous peoples resist this encroachment and extraction of the natural resource base. 
Some end up in violent resistance, even to the point of armed struggle against the concessionaires. Some keep their silence and remain passive. Some become, quote-unquote, collaborators. This leads to a polarization not only between foreign corporations and the indigenous communities, but also between indigenous peoples themselves. The culture of the indigenous peoples, and essentially their entire lives, are rooted in the environment they live in. Their subsistence depends on their lands. Their ancestors are buried there, making them sacred grounds. Their diwatas live there, present in the very waters they drink and fish from, the forest where they hunt, and the land they till. The life of the indigenous people is anchored on their ancestral lands, or whatever is left of it. With the exploitation of the natural resource base of the indigenous communities, which is part of their very being and where their entire identities are grounded, where do they find peace and the rightful place in the scheme of things? Environmental justice. Where communities are rightfully engaged in any development efforts in their lands to give them hand in the reins of the direction of the community's struggle for a better life. There are, however, cultural challenges to the Western idea of environmental protection vis-a-vis the indigenous belief system. Land cannot be owned. People are only stewards, and as much, it is for everyone who can cultivate it. No, it's called usufra. However, it is also for this reason that planting trees are uncommon as it, sig it signifies ownership. Usufra and planting trees are polar ends among some indigenous communities. The mapping style of bloom upon marriage is required to open a plot through swiden cultivation or kaingin, lest he will be cursed by the diwata to an unproductive horticultural life. All these are rooted in the indigenous belief system, therefore ingrained in the very psyche of every individual. The ways of the indigenous peoples may have changed by modernity, but some of these beliefs remain. Development and environmental justice will not fly without considering the cultural structures of the indigenous communities. There has to be a meeting of the commercial interests, foreign or local, and community welfare. Respect for self-determination enshrined in the constitution and the IPRA must be upheld with caution. Hunger and poverty may push them to the brink of losing their environment, but we remind them that the future of the community's survival rests on the young who will depend more on the potential abundance of their lands. And so, their voices must be included in the process. During our assessment on the conduct of the Free and, free and Prior Informed Consent, or the FPIC, there had been clamor that, only participation, that the only participation the communities get is to join that meeting facilitated by the NCIP. Beyond that, a lot of the promises are buried among other forms. Some communities, though, report good report with communities who comply with SDM requirements adequately, if not completely. Let me end with a creation story of the Matig Salo with San Fernando. It offers us an insight to the protection of and the oneness of people and their environment. The creation story describes the world as a mirror-like platform supported by gold beams. On top of this mirror-like platform, well, perhaps referring to the waters, inhabited is inhabited by various creations on the land form on its surface. They believe that if you mine the gold, the entire platform collapses and all life within it. The environment, culture, and lives of the indigenous peoples are intertwined and entangled. The fight to save the environment is a struggle for life and the continuance of their survival as a people. Thank you. With our initiatives in Indonesia and, and uh, the region, that there is a value that goes beyond the amount of investments you put in, ver in terms of uh, solidarity movement building. Strengthening the Menokan, uh, strengthening the communities and the activists w w uh, working in these communities are important if you, uh, and the need to link them to others is very, very crucial. Local communities, when impacted by environmental damage, will bear the cost of the damage immediately, but also in the future, as you see uh, in, uh, in the impact of um, uh, typhoons uh, uh, and uh, disasters. 
Um, I think that's my last slide. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Christy Nazawa. The, the mining was stopped. However, at that time, irreversible damage was also already done to this, um, to this uh, sacred grounds. And uh, offerings of local communities found in these areas have now been lost forever. If you remember, uh, the earliest humanoids uh, in Southeast Asia were found in this uh, island group of Entete uh, in, uh, uh, in the island of uh, Flores. And this island is actually south of that. So this community is a very ancient community. And so the, 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 the traditions and offerings that have been lost because of this activity um, you know, is 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 um, is um, centuries and centuries of um, worth of uh, offerings in this uh, in these marble mines. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is Molo's philosophy. Um, I'll not read the 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 text of that, but basically they realize that water is blood, forest is skin, lung, and hair. Soil is flesh and stone is bone. This is the spirit that embodied the struggle from 1999 to 2009 against four mining companies in cutting their uh, name stones or patukana. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, these women basically uh, led the protest. Uh, they actually... Um, uh, what they call a uh, weaving sit in they brought all their weaving paraphernalia in the in the limestones uh, across uh, the communities uh, they spent um, uh, two months uh, weaving uh, non-stop uh, protecting their uh, name stones against mine next slide please <clears throat> so my uh, the status Mining for a marble uh, was finally stopped by national and local government in 20, uh, 2009 uh, in the three territories of the communities of Molo, Amanabun, and Amanatum. Uh, this was led by a woman leader called Aleta Baun. Uh, and after they won, they have begun, they, they began to restore customary ties among these communities, reviving their customary rituals, and other indigenous knowledge and practices and trying to follow a development for a principle that says we sell what we create and we will not sell what we cannot create uh, but recovering what has been lost takes more time than actually losing them uh, and they still need to secure tenurial rights to their territories for the future of their communities next slide please uh, that is, this is Aleta Baun. Uh, she won the Goldman Award in 2013. And she has set aside that Goldman Award, the prize award, to set up a Mama Aleta Fund to actually continue to, um, to uh, train what they call Nausus and Lulbas. These are local women leaders, uh, young and emerging leaders uh, across uh, the, their territories, but also uh, uh, with a vision of doing that across uh, Indonesia. <clears throat> next slide, please. Uh, the next um, slides I'm going to show you are not necessarily investments by foreign companies, but actually have been impacted by demands, not only from local uh, uh, demands, but international demands. Uh, this is a community of women that have been engaged in sugarcane uh, production, as in the, not in uh, in uh, in open uh, land sugarcane uh, uh, planting, but in their gardens in in agroforests. Um, we supported them after they won against a logging concession in uh, in their territories in 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 Kalimantan. Uh, uh, and they, with the small grants, 
And they have also been leading in terms of recovering the livelihoods of their communities, which have been lost because of um, conflict with the logging concessions uh, in, for, 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 for decades. Next slide. <clears throat> You're all familiar with this, oil plum plantation. This is driving many of the um, clearing in uh, licenses um, by issuing licenses across Indonesia. Recently, the government of Indonesia has uh, put a moratorium on new oil palm plantations, but these are already existing oil palm plantations, and the demand for palm oil continues to drive uh, some of the uh, clearing uh, uh, for uh, uh, of uh, forest remaining forest in Indonesia. Um, next slide, please. This is a community that has been protesting um, uh, 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 and, in, uh, um, uh, and have conflicts over uh, their territories and uh, uh, the, the companies in Kalimantan. This is one of their community meetings. Now, I'm sure uh, many of you have drunk Sumatran coffee. Coffee is, uh, is a, is a high-value crop that has been promoted as a, um, you know, uh, for livelihood uh, and, uh, and for um, uh, as an um, environment-friendly commodity. It has an, a local and international value chain. However, the focus on individual, um, on, on mo monocropping, like coffee, uh, from our experience with funding uh, Akar Benkulu uh, for the production of Akar coffee, uh, two years ago or three years ago, they realized that a focus on coffee alone um, basically produced hidden hunger in the community because um, their traditional food systems have been replaced by a single commodity uh, food production, which is coffee. And this uh, serves um, uh, not the local, um, not just the local market, but international markets as well. Next slide, please. So the lessons from this is that communities continue their struggle to survive after winning one fight. They not only lose time, but energy as they focus on defending their territory. And sometimes it is one fight after another in some communities. They have to play catch up and sometimes new and innovative actions results into other problems like hidden hunger. Um, CSOs accompanying communities need to be self-critical so that they can continue to learn with the community by rec recognizing failures or challenges. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, I won't be, uh, I won't profess to be a, uh, um, uh, very knowledgeable about the Mekong River. I think the presentation from Un earlier on was very comprehensive. Um, uh, this, if you will uh, see, is part of the Mekong, the lower Mekong region. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, Un has mentioned about the creation of dams in the lower Mekong, which has driven um, which is, which is being driven by the need for energy uh, in China, particularly for the dams in Laos. Um, uh, the, the experience I will share with you is basically the experience of uh, uh, after the typhoon uh, Linfa uh, uh, two or three years ago, which actually uh, created um, um, uh, or displaced communities in, in some parts of Laos along the river um, uh, when a dam was uh, opened up because of, uh, you know, uh, of the typhoon. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, so this had resulted to physically displacing communities. Um, these last two slides. Uh, basically shows the communities which uh, were affected by that tropical storm. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so this is a renewable energy source, um, micro uh, hydro. Um, but how does this impact, um, you know, communities that you know um, 
um, uh, that are affected because of the operations of this renewable energy source. Next slide, please. So lessons from Southeast Asia. This is uh, my final slide. Um, the impacts of their environmental damage are first local before they are global. Uh, and we are a Southeast Asian Institute um, born um, in the Philippines in 2003 um, and covers the whole of Southeast Asia. Um, so I wasn't really sure what should be covered, but this was one of my invitation. So I'm covering local welfare vis-a-vis -vis foreign interests, some lessons in Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. So the outline of the presentation, I'll give a background on some dana. I'll present Indonesian cases and uh, I will add a, just a little in terms of the lo lower Mekong and I've heard uh, Un's presentation. I won't, uh, dig, uh, I won't delve deeper into that. And then I will summarize in terms of lessons learned. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So Samdana Institute is a, is a re, is a, has a vision of a region where natural, cultural, and spiritual diversity are valued and where communities have access and control and responsibility over their territories and well-being. Next slide, please. We were established in 2003, as I said, in the Philippines and registered in Indonesia in 2005. Uh, we have a small office in, uh, we have part, uh, we have um, uh, partners in, in Laos, in Thailand, in Malaysia, in, um, in the rest of uh, Southeast Asia. Um, we're focused on supporting the social and environmental movement in this region. Uh, we were established by environment and development workers, activists working across uh, this region. Our core programs include small grants for indigenous peoples and local communities, local um, um, civil society organizations, and local leaders. Uh, we also focus on capacity development and policy support. We have a living livescapes program, which is, uh, allows us to dig deeper into issues and concerns and uh, innovations in um, certain areas of Indonesia and the Philippines. This includes Northern Mindanao, uh, the Calamianes Island groups in northern Palawan, and the two Papua provinces in Indonesia. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we started off as a community um, grant making for uh, funding the unfundable or reaching the unreachable in, in the region. And this is a summary of our small grants uh, in the Mekong, the Philippines, and Indonesia. Next slide, please. All the lessons we are going to bring today is based on our lessons on primarily on our small granting, but our work with indigenous peoples and local communities. This may be familiar with you, but I'm not going to talk about this. This is the uh, Freeport uh, mining area in, uh, uh, in, the, Papua, in the province of Papua uh, in Indonesia. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, so I'll focus on uh, examples or um, cases uh, that, um, uh, that we uh, uh, support our partners on uh, in relation to environmental justice or uh, engagement or uh, conflict resolution with uh, corporations. Um, um, so um, uh, this is just to provide you a visual of where uh, these cases are. So um, Molo is in the west of uh, uh, East Timor, for those who are not familiar with Indonesia. Kendeng is in the central part of Java. Mahakam Ulu is in East Kalimantan province. Uh, and Akar Binkulu in, is in the southern part of the island of Sumatra. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so our, my first case is about um, in the cement in central Java. Um, uh, it's an affiliate of Heidelberg Cement, so it's part of the Heidelberg uh, group. Um, and Heidelberg has been known to have a very strong sustainability strategy. 
um, highlighted here sustainable business practices as well as trusting relations with our neighbors, business partners, and employees. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, they have a very strong sustainability targets, which have uh, focus on environmental and social goals, um, taking their social responsibility very seriously in the different locations that, that includes that should include uh, in uh, Central Java. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so you see, they have a very um, you know, extensive um, sustainability principles in writing. Uh, and they're, um, they're um, uh, promoted as one of the examples of good governance in, in, in corporations, in global corporations or global communities, um, uh, focusing on corporate um, social responsibility. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, they have operations in the limestones in Kendeng, which is in so central Java. Uh, and this case focuses on that particular part of uh, their operations uh, in the central part of Java. This is a limestone area. These are the community of women, Kendeng's women, who actually oppose the, uh, the mining uh, operations in their communities. Uh, because um, uh, these limestones are considered uh, sacred by these communities. This is a scene in a protest in front of the presidential palace where the community, the women actually cemented <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> themselves to illustrate or to demonstrate <coughs> their objections to, uh, to the operations of Indo-Cement in their territory. Uh, after this um, uh, protest, uh, actually one of the women uh, passed away um, um, uh, in relation to the days that they were actually cemented. Samdana provided urgent action support for them, not for the, uh, uh, this demonstration, but for the women to actually leave some money behind for their families as they... Um, lead in the opposition for um, for um, uh, uh, opposition against um, uh, the Indo Cement Mine uh, license that was issued in their territory. Next slide. <clears throat> so the status and lessons in this this is still ongoing up to today. Indo Cement continues to lay claim on the traditional territories of the Kendeng communities even as the community has won the court case against Indo-Cement. Um, the communities continue to struggle. They are supported by CSOs. They, they protest in various forms. On the ground, they tree plant uh, in areas which they are claiming. And in Germany, for example, um, uh, in, um, uh, activists have um, uh, post uh, have uh, set up painting exhibitions of the women protesting as part of their support to the claims of um, uh, of uh, uh, of uh, these communities. So the question is, how do sustainability principles translate when territories of IPLCs have been appropriated by national government through their licensing system? for use by community com companies. There are international guidelines on how business should operate, but in the end, sustainability principles are voluntary and subject to different interpretations at the local level, therefore not enforceable. The next case, next slide please, <clears throat> um, is in Molo. Uh, this is in, for those who are not familiar with the geography of Indonesia, this is uh, in the western part, central western part of the island of Timur. This is an another limestone, Fatukanaf, or name stones in Nusa Tenggara Timur. Um, uh, is, is the, uh, was, um, uh, was being mined in this area. Um, this again has to do with sacred uh, territories. Each limestone formation or fatukana is associated with a community. These stones have names. They have been named by communities. 
and therefore they are um, they have identity. The intimate relationship between human and patukanap is not only physical or emotional, but spiritual as well. So this issue um, uh, was very, this is a case that started in 1999. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, where um, this case, it's... Um, you know, just caring for the environment is like, you know, caring for children. You don't know how things are going to turn out. Um, you, you do the best that you can. You love as hard as you can. You help as much as you can. And that's sort of what we're here for is to continue along in those lines. And so all across the globe, no matter what continent or country we're from, we share that. I share that with you. You share that with me. Um, and no matter where we are, we, we share that, that common ethic uh, in our lives. So thank you for letting me be a part of that. Now, for just a few um, comments to, uh, in responses to the reactors, and, and the reactors' responses, I, I think, were just brilliant. Um, I don't have anything more intelligent to say. But I, I do have some reactions to the reactions, uh, and, and I'll keep them very brief. So um, first, with regard uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Um, Tri uh, Trilanis, I'm sorry again if I'm mispronouncing your name. name. Cheeto, is that right? Is that close enough? Okay, forgive me, okay? Um, again, fantastic comments. Uh, and my takeaway from that is about Again, our shared humanity, and uh, and that people who stand up for what's right tend also to be people who have to um, overcome their fair share of mistreatment by those in power. You talked about environmental human rights defenders. Uh, do you know? Uh, you know everyone who's listening of the you know, two hundred and fifty some odd people who are part of this program that on an annual basis, more than 200 people are murdered by government officials. And where those people, I'm sorry, are human uh, environmental rights defenders, people standing up for the environment. So that's an average of uh, about a little more than three people every week um, are, uh, are murdered by the rich and the powerful. Uh, and people who, uh, you know, who will do anything it takes to get something done the way they want it to be done. So it isn't only in the Philippines, but Philippines is a hotspot for uh, environmental human rights abuses, uh, you know, with uh, you know, being labeled as terrorists or meddlers um, or obstructionists. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, tragic to hear and it breaks my heart to hear it. And it's something that's that's occurring all around you know the globe. Um, uh, secondly, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Trelanis mentioned about rights of nature. So, so Cheeto, I didn't talk much about rights of nature because I was thinking rather narrowly about this convergence of environmental justice and environmental rights, right? An anthropocentric point of view. But you're exactly right. That's not the only point of view for any of this. There are growing conversations about rights of nature, whether nature has a right to um, a healthy environment, I'm sorry, <laughs> to protect itself. Um, the United Nations is considering that through its Harmony with Nature program. Some countries recognize a legal personality of nature uh, in Ecuador, it's through the concept of Pachamama, and it's incorporated in the uh, Ecuadorian constitution, and it's in legislation in um, Bolivia, uh, in New Zealand and elsewhere, in some courts, as, as I'm sure you know, if you're part of this program, you know, India and Nepal and elsewhere have recognized, and Pakistan have recognized the legal personality of nature. So it's a very young concept. So in 50 years, um, when my children are my age, roughly, uh, I wonder if there'll be a lot more acceptance that you know nature has a voice and it deserves a seat at the table. Um, so uh, next, uh, Mr. Antonio, uh, the comments about, you know, uh, the way I think of it is um, is creating structures for advancing environmental justice, and it's hard to do. I don't again. I don't have any uh, 
you know, I don't know what the answers are. I mean, I have my own questions about it, but what you laid out, I think is right on. First is to, I mean, I heard three things, and that's first is to recognize the economic interests at play and the economic burdens, uh, I'm sorry, the, you know, the economic um, pressures uh, on a society and in a country. You know, there's a right to development as well. The, the sustainable development goals recognize sovereignty and a right uh, to development and self-autonomy and self-agency. And part of that is, you know, by being able to find a job, build a, uh, a company, um, and some of that involves despoiling the environment. So there are these economic forces that make it more challenging to advance environmental justice. But being honest about that, it's like, again, like being in a relationship, but being honest about that is the starting point. That's the first thing I heard, and I agree. The second thing is what to do about it. And that's through legislation uh, to to take, you know, to, to, to provide means to address uh, environmental injustice. But to do that through law, do that through democracy, because ultimately that makes it so the law is more likely to be followed. It doesn't mean it will be, right? We know that, but it makes it more likely. And third and last is about enforcement, that, you know, uh, a, a right without a remedy is nothing, you know, uh, that there needs to be enforcement. And that's where, again, everyone who's a part of this call probably has personal experience with that journey, the journey of trying to get uh, compliance with legal requirements or, or just to stand up for what's right. So, uh, Mr. Antonio, again, thank you for those comments. I'm inspired by them. And then lastly, um, and I, uh, Mr. Uh, Syasith, and again, forgive me, I hope that was close enough. Um, I, I really, you know, I appreciated your comments um, as well. And this, where you started off, um, it, this will stick with me. It's very late where I am as well, but it will stick, stick with me for the remainder of the evening, uh, in the remainder of the week, is that part of the objective of advancing environmental justice, you know, is just doing what's right, what's fair, you know, for, for everybody, for men, for women, for people, regardless of what their status is in life, what their so-called class is, uh, because we're all, um, in, we all have equal worth. You do, I do, we're all of the same equal worth. And we're all entitled to, um, to, to agency and autonomy and self-determination. I mean, you are, your children are, your grandchildren will be, everyone who came, we're, we're all in the same boat that way. And what I heard Mr. from Mr. Um, Syaseth is that part of the objective of, of environmental justice is to ensure that the voices of all are heard, that everyone's voice is heard. And I see that as part of what environmental justice can do. It can do it structurally by, you know, um, by providing, you know, uh, means for, for sharing information, you know, meetings, assemblies, things like this, like what you're doing with this is a means of promoting that. And it can be done legally by, uh, by having laws that ensure that everyone has a voice when it comes to decisions affecting the environment. Why? Because that's fair. You know, there are almost 8 billion inhabitants on the planet now. It's a lot of, it's a lot of noise, a lot of crowded, you know, a, a lot of, it's, it's busy. But everyone is entitled to speak their piece, to say what's on their mind, and to try to see to it that the planet, um, that, um, that, uh, uh, that future generations um, uh, or live in is livable, you know. Because remember, this is the you know the old Cherokee um, saying about how um, you know future generations that they don't inherit the earth from us; we borrow it from them. So anyway, again, with peace and love, uh, uh, I'll probably drop off of the conference. But I appreciate the opportunity to share these thoughts with you with all of my friends throughout the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. James Army. Indeed, we are the defenders. Um, data sharing and uh, transboundary cooperation in, in the Mekong. So between the Mekong River Commission and Lanshan Mekong Cooperation, there have been an increased cooperation so far 
at least from the data sharing perspective. So in the, in the past 20 years ago, China only shared uh, rainy season data to lower Mekong countries. However, through the regular exchange and cooperation in the last two years, China have, uh, has agreed to share two season data that is including dry season and, and uh, 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 rainy season, which increase um, sort of uh, availability of data for low, lower Mekong part to plan their water resources planning and also to adapt themselves to you know, changes that might come from the regulated flows. So in, in, in ending my um, short presentation here, I think there are still a lot to do in the Mekong region to ensure environmental justice and better environmental outcomes. And this is the platform that we, we in, the, in the Mekong region are very uh, eagerly, eager to learn from friends like the US and probably the, probably the, the friends in other Mekong, other Mekong or ASEAN countries. Thank you. To speak to this forum um, with acknowledgement of the great presentation from Professor James on the environmental justice. Um, I am very happy to be speaking about um, the issues in the Mekong and how partners are, are intending to sort of strengthen the environmental outcomes here. Um, so the topic I'm going to uh, speak to today is the transboundary cooperation uh, among and between countries in the Mekong region uh, involving uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, and our upper country, China and Myanmar. So um, as you know that uh, the Mekong um, started from Tibet Plateau and runs through uh, six countries, the country that I just mentioned. It's, it's a great um, source of life. It provides livelihood, fisheries, economic opportunities, and you name it for, for the prosperous of the region. So over the last three or four decades, the river has experienced rapid economic developments that, um, of course, includes increase of population, increased energy demands, and so on and so forth, you name it. So in the Mekong um, itself, uh, on the mainstream, there are over 25 dams, hydropower dams, planned and in operation so far. So in upper part of China, there are currently 11 dams that are in operation, and a few more are being planned. The lower part, which start from uh, Laos until uh, Cambodia and Vietnam, there are another 11 dams. And already two have been built in Laos, in my own country. <clears throat> so these, these, these dams in the Mekong mainstream are in addition to more than 200 dams currently planned and developed in its tributaries. So you can imagine that the, the huge volume of water being regulated um, that can have sort of impact to the livelihoods of the people in, in the lower part. So through this hydropower development, um, it creates a number of challenges, including flows are no longer natural. It's now being regulated and mostly for hydropower, power generation purpose. It often creates um, flood and droughts in the lower part and therefore uh, affecting fish fisheries, affecting agriculture, food security, and um, salinity intrusion in the Mekong Delta, which is in, in, in the part of um, Vietnam. 
so it all in all it it puts the the region um quite vulnerable to food security and and it's just mentioned by the professor on the um climate change and how that amplified the challenges that I've, I've just made so in the mekong um i myself work for australian embassy here in laos but covers um, the mekong region we also work quite a lot with our us friends through their um, us mekong partnership uh, and then Mekong, Mekong safeguards in, in, the, in the Mekong region. So that's, that's about Mekong and the challenge. So um, what I've been asked to, to speak to is the transboundary cooperation to address um, the, you know, better environmental outcomes and justice. <clears throat> so in the Mekong, we have the Mekong River Commission it's an intergovernmental organization that was created 20, 26 years ago in 19, 1995 under Mekong 1995 agreement. The intention of the organization is to facilitate regional cooperation for sustainable development in the Mekong. So under this Mekong 1995 agreement, there are a number of procedures that required member states to put or to notify uh, their intention to develop a project on the Mekong. And, and once the notification is submitted to the Mekong River Commission, then the Secretariat will put the information into public space for uh, public knowledge and knowledge sharing. And then there are a number of um, states that require the member countries to, to coordinate, to discuss, to negotiate. So there is one uh, procedure that, that have been very active so far. It's called pyro notification, pyro consultation and agreement. This has been um, quite active so far because uh, of the dam development. The, so far, there have been two, two dams have been developed in Laos. The first one is Sayaburi Dam. The second one is Don Sanghong. And there are a number uh, under pipeline and being negotiated. So in terms of practical process, this is, um, in responding to uh, Professor James' uh, presentation as well, to ensure that the voice and the concerns of all stakeholders are heard and taken into, into consideration in the process. The, the um, MRC Secretariat will put the notified document to the public space for people to, to inform themselves and then come prepare into the regional stakeholder consultation. So at, at each country level, there are sort of two rounds of national, national consultation, which involve uh, civil society, government, private sector, research institution to, to voice themselves, to voice their concern to their country um, level. And then at the end, there will be a regional consultation where four member countries, including representative for from civil society discuss the proposed hydropower dam. This, this process has six months time, time frame. People, some people negotiate or, or this still debate that this is not enough. But at the end of the process, the four member country will reach a joint statement and joint action plan. So there are a number of points that needs to be followed up if the dam were able were, was to go ahead. For example, there are a process for all four member countries to monitor during the construction phase, during the operation phase, and um, monitoring of the of the change of the changes in the river. So the the process is quite um, good, to my opinion, 
uh, it provides uh, member member states and civil society to be part of the process from the from the um, beginning until the operation part. However, um, you know, challenge still remains because um, you know pe people people from different stakeholders have different perspectives. So they it's, it's still an ongoing debate whether or not the Mekong River Commission has done enough. But for us as um, development partners to the Mekong River Commission, we think that the, the process put in place is, is better than nothing. It provides opportunity platform for stakeholders to voice their concerns and, and ensure that their, their, their concerns are heard along the process. Now, in terms of um, transboundary cooperation with uh, upper riparian countries, China and Myanmar, you may know that China since 2016 create Mekong River, Me Mekong, uh, Lanshang Mekong Cooperation Framework, which is a framework where in the morning right now, where I am at. I'm actually in Barcelona and it's uh, 2.40 <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> so this is, I just couldn't say no to my friends uh, who invited me to be one of the reactors. So even if I had to stay <laughs> awake for the entire night, I, I, I will have to ju just have to do this. Anyway, uh, I... Uh, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor James, for, for that very enlightening uh, talk that you uh, did uh, a while back. And uh, it, it really, uh, well, it doesn't really, well, it tells us from here, from our vantage point, point in the Philippines, that uh, the, U, uh, the United States has really gone a lot, uh, done a lot and have gone uh, really far in so far as uh, institutionalizing environmental justice. However, there are uh, there's still a lot to be done in the Philippines for us to be able to cope uh, with uh, how the Americans have already done it uh, in, uh, yeah, uh, in the U.S. Now, uh, let me just uh, input some problems that, I, that are in my mind right now. Number one um, is the legislation here. Uh, we are supposed to be, the Philippines is supposed to be a democracy. So we are ruled by laws as our, uh, we have a lady judge with us right now. And uh, she would, uh, I think, uh, testify to the fact that uh, we are a democracy and we're governed by laws. However, environmental laws are quite uh, not that popular with our legislators. So even if, um, uh, and the mixing of politics and the business makes it quite impossible for us to come up with environmental laws because most of the people in, in the legislature are also businessmen who are trying to protect their, uh, their businesses that have something to do with the environment. So that, that's a big problem there. Then, uh, okay, when it comes to talking about uh, okay, what could say organizations, uh, private organizations in the Philippines, what could they do uh, in, with regards to pushing for environmental laws? W what we could only do here actually is just lobby for them, but there isn't really much we could do uh, except for being noisy. And if they, they, uh, if they don't look or uh, give our... Um, our suggestions, uh, their, their minute, <laughs> there's really nothing we can do again. And uh, especially if uh, there is no formal organization or there are no organizations that are really looking into all of this. Uh, there are a few uh, organized environmental groups in, in the Philippines, but however, they're not too much into lobbying for uh, legislation. There is one big uh, environmental organization in the Philippines, which is the DNR. But, however, the DNR is a 
it's a government uh, entity. So what do we really expect from them? So then we have, okay, assuming that the, the uh, that uh, environmental laws are done, are, are, are legislated, there is also another problem of enforcement. Because uh, first, uh, who will enforce? Uh, but before the enforcement anyway, we also have a, uh, there, there is a relief actually we could do as private citizens, we could always go to the courts and, and like what uh, my good friend Chito and his group has done. However, there's a big problem again, uh, as uh, he might have uh, given us a little uh, information about, the justice system in the Philippines really works very, very slowly. So that's a big problem. You don't have any organization, then the, the justice system is so slow, really nothing much could be done. Then uh, also, yeah, uh, another uh, stumbling block, I think, which is the biggest one, uh, there is a uh, point of concern between ec the, our, you know, economics and our environment here in the Philippines. You know, uh, especially with the two year, more, more than two years of pandemic, uh, a lot of people are either un, uh, unemployed or underemployed right now. And there is a big problem in so far of the, as the Filipino is concerned. We are all concerned about putting three square meals on the table every day. And we should do this first before we even look into our environment. So the, our uh, financial and economic woes take precedence over the environment right now. So how long will we be able to, uh, to, um, to go be, uh, over our pandemic problems will probably uh, be the starting point for our uh, getting engaged again in, in our environmental concerns. However, let me, let me just end. Uh, I hope, uh, Professor May, uh, James, you have uh, taken note of those little concerns that we have. And uh, let me just end with a very a little positive note. Uh, if we're um, environmental justice also entails uh, clean air, let me just tell you that the two years that we had uh, this uh, COVID pandemic, the air in Manila, where I live, I'm actually in Barcelona right now, but the air in Manila, where I live, has been pretty good, better than the usual in the, in the pandemic period. So thank you very much. And I hope... Uh, yeah, uh, lastly, yeah, I, I have another uh, point in mind. Um, we need also to be, uh, somebody has to spearhead all of this so we could uh, really look into where we are. To, to be uh, perfectly honest, we really don't know what's going on with government or in, in this uh, government. And if there are private groups really involved in this, in, in environmental justice, what they are doing, we don't know. Uh, there has to be more information on this. So if there are other uh, organizations or environmental organizations, even uh, uh, advocates could chip in whatever uh, little they could. And so we could get our uh, act together. And perhaps uh, as, uh, as I've said in, my, in the beginning of, of, of this reaction, was we would like to catch up with the U.S. on environmental justice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our dear... Because uh, even in the Philippines, we see uh, the provision on in Article 2, Section 16 of the 1907 uh, Constitution that is more uh, centered on human rights on the people. But uh, we do not see any provision of law that uh, focuses also on uh, providing rights for nature. We uh, believe that uh, nature should not be uh, taken as separate from us or a setting that we live. We are part of it and um, we constantly interact with it. This is uh, the statement of uh, Pope Francis in uh, 
the encyclical Laudato Si. So if we are part of nature, then uh, nature should also be given its rights, not only human beings, because um, as an activist, I realize uh, that um, with the uh, provisions of law um, providing for uh, conservation of our environment, we seldom uh, see any uh, discussions on uh, advocating for the rights of nature. And um, I have experienced uh, the difficulties being activist for human rights and environment, the red tagging, etc. And, uh, you know, uh, my peers have been uh, killed and some survive, uh, luckily. But because uh, the, uh, the, the, the laws that we have in the Philippines really are the policies, uh, we see more uh, conflicting policies that are... Uh, uh, in place in the country. Say, for instance, um, you have cited uh, the uh, rules on procedure for environmental cases. We have uh, uh, applied that in, in our setting and we filed a case in court. Uh, we filed an injunction with prayer for environmental protection order and the court uh, granted the, 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 uh, the petition but the agency is concerned that the DNRMGB did not uh, uh, enforce the ruling of the court. So there is no the conflict between uh, judiciary and uh, the agencies that are tasked to uh, enforce uh, regulations, policies, or even decisions of courts. And uh, while we uh, are aggressive on uh, asserting the rights that has been provided under the Constitution and even in other st statutes, uh, we uh, encounter uh, this uh, this uh, you know uh, red tagging uh, incidents because uh, when we assert rights, when we uh, go to communities and advocate for human rights and for the protection of the environment, we are tagged as being members of the Reds. We are communists. We are uh, terrorists. So life really of an activist is really hard. I uh, was able to share this uh, during the 7th Dublin platform when I was invited because of uh, the, the experience that I had in our country. But uh, we believe that we must continue because what we are doing is for the good of humanity and uh, the environment. So what is lacking, I, I believe, in our presentation would be including uh, nature to have its rights. In the Philippines today, the Philippine Missionary, uh, Philippine Missionary Partnership Incorporated, together with the National uh, Secretariat for Social Action, is advo advocating for the rights of nature. So there is already a bill that has been filed in the uh, Senate that's authored by uh, Sen Senator uh, Hontiveros. But uh, we know how, how Congress works. The lobby money is really in place. And uh, every uh, every uh, legislative advocacy proposals for the uh, protection of the environment seems to die naturally in uh, the chambers, both in the lower and the upper house. So I hope uh, this should be a global discussion also to consider giving uh, more time discussing uh, on the rights of nature so we believe that uh, this is a very important uh, uh, this uh, topic for discussion, considering that we are now in a climate emergency. Thank you, Paul, and uh, good day. There are two uh, issues in relation to palm oil plantations. Um, um, palm oil plantations are um, given licenses by the national government, in the case of Indonesia, given um, um, uh, uh, licenses by the national government for areas that are not only open areas, but actually for forested areas. Um, so if you issue um, a land use a license for palm oil, then you have to cut the forest down uh, to actually make way for the oil palm plantation. So you can produce oil palm 
um, palm, uh, and 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 um, you can plant oil palm uh, and produce palm oil if you actually clear the land, as you have seen in the picture. Uh, it is not a plant that can be uh, intercropped uh, that needs a shade or can be uh, coexist with a natural forest. So you are actually replacing the natural forest. So in terms of climate, you are releasing carbon uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, in terms of communities, uh, they are issuing licenses in territories which are um, uh, of, of indigenous uh, communities who have traditionally been in the land have been dependent on the land, have been dependent on the forest. So once they clear the forest, then you actually displace the community of their livelihood, displace the community of their indigenous knowledge systems, and their claim to the territory which precedes uh, uh, the, the oil palm plantation. The second issue that relates to palm oil, um, uh, that relates to palm oil and oil palm is that the demand for um, palm oil is actually a global demand. It's not just a local demand. Um, so the, the biggest and the uh, highest consumer of palm oil is actually India and China. <clears throat> and so this is driving the volume of palm oil that is actually producing, uh, that, be, that is being produced uh, globally, so that uh, this uh, this global demand, this very high demand for palm oil, actually, um, in terms of demand supply, drives down the cost of palm oil. Therefore, you have cheaper palm oil that is cheaper compared to other, um, you know, um, uh, oil uh, products um, like uh, coconut oil. Therefore, traditional um, use of coconut by coastal communities are also being replaced by palm oil. Um, so the global demand is driving the deforestation. It's also driving the conflict that is rise, uh, that emerges when uh, um, licenses are issued over territories of indigenous peoples and local communities that are being claimed uh, by these uh, people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma'am Nuzawa, for clarifying that to us. Uh, uh, now, uh, I'm going to read one of the questions in the board uh, question. So, uh, uh, the anonymous attendees is saying that, uh, in general, this webinar is very, oh, it's very good. Knowledge and information are good. The title of environmental justice is great. However, taking into consideration that strict implement, uh, implementers are also subjected to harassment and in the intimidation from corrupt in, uh, implementers and environmental predator exploiters who are rich, powerful, and influential, my question is, what is the measure in place to protect these strict, honest implementers who advocate environmental justice and protection. I have a quick response, if I may start. Sure, ma'am. Um, yeah, I wish there were measures in place. <laughs> Actually, I don't think there are a lot. In fact, I, I think somebody said it earlier that, uh, and there was a study actually about this, that the Philippines is one of the most dangerous places for an environmental you know, worker. And so, you know, many times I, I myself, I'm careful about, you know, advertising <laughs> that I'm working in this space, right? But, um, yeah, I, 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 there, I, do, I really don't know um, if there are really um, substantial measures in place. Maybe locally we can see some because maybe some communities or local governments are, have put in, you know, policies and programs that are, you know, and working with actually with... Um, with, with NGOs or with individuals who are um, working for the environment. But on, on a bigger scale, um, I'm not sure. Maybe we can ask the, the lawyers here in the room. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much for that, Mom. Um, so uh, 
Any of our uh, reactors who also want to add on that? because they have still a huge uh, amount of their areas forested, then deforestation is a major challenge uh, in the Philippines because um, the situation is, um, is different, that there are less uh, forests in, in, uh, in the Philippines. There's still challenge in terms of deforestation, but there's a greater challenge in terms of forest restoration um uh and uh in 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 both cases um in the indonesia and the philippines are um what they call mega diversity countries so loss of biological di diversity happens because talking about you know an e a natural ecosystems that are unique to this uh, region or to countries um in the marine area you have um the same in terms of loss of uh, natural uh, mangrove systems for example but also natural coral reef um seagrass and you know um seabed um ecosystems uh and uh you know overfishing uh in in these waters um but uh in the urban areas and you know many of the communities you have challenges of environmental waste uh um which actually indicates um you know um less productivity because there's a lot of wastage uh happening uh, but there's been a, a um, push to actually consider more about uh waste in in terms of plastics but i think there's waste overall uh, in uh, in uh, many uh, communities and many urban areas. Um, so those are, for me, challenges that, um, uh, that are faced uh, by um, uh, many in the region. Um, now, how to address this? Each country is addressing it in their own way. Uh, legal measures are being put in place. Policy measures are being put in place. Uh, CSOs are doing voluntary work, um, also advocating and challenging government to do more, uh, as well as challenging business to do more. So uh, I think um, uh, that um, is, um, you know, a general response to a very general question. Thank you, Ma'am Christy. Uh, it's a follow-up question to follow-up question to Sep. I think uh, same question Sep given to Ms. Nusawa. Uh, you're working on that very beautiful island, your background, the screen. But have you experienced any challenges like, you know, in the community? And what are those challenges? Yes, uh, for sure. Um, it's, it's very challenging. I always say it's, it's easier to work with animals than people, you know, <laughs> because when you're with a community, you know, you're working with a local government unit, you're working with um, communities who are also have you know, priorities, you know, such as um, food on the table and the health and education of their children. And then you go and talk about the environment. So, um, and then just recently, um, as you know, Vis the Visayas was also hit by Typhoon Odette. So we were actually, our island was uh, damaged uh, last December and we were already um, re recovering in terms of like, um, because we do have an ecotourism program. So again, it and we know that's also related to climate change, and 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 the drivers of climate change are also you know are, are human um, related, are human activities related to human activities. So um, I think for me, based on um, my work with communities, it's also about linking um, environmental problems such as uh, plastic pollution or overfishing. Um, with um with their own lives you know when we when we started talking about plastic pollution uh we, you know we were first showing this video i'm sure you've seen this because it, it has gone viral so there's a video of of a straw you know stuck in a turtle's um uh, in the turtle's uh, nostril and then we were showing it to the fisher folk and then i mean literally one of them said said na like i know what is um why will i care about the, uh, a straw you know up the turtle's nose you know and when i'm worried about feeding my family so i think the challenge is also to connect um environmental issues with you know daily issues um issues that are all filipinos and and you know even other nations face and so when we link for example plastic pollution 
with um, communities' health, with their food. You know, we're seeing food up. There's also plastic now in our food, and that will affect the health of our children. Um, I think they will better understand uh, the issue and like they see themselves um, that uh, affected and hopefully they all they will also see themselves as part of the solution. So I think this is one challenge. How how do we communicate that and how do we engage um, more stakeholders, not the usual suspects uh, that are your environmental warriors, but everybody um, to, to join the fight um, for environmental protection. Salamat <laughs> Back to you, Lily. All right. Thank you so much again for answering. Um, and in terms of um, choices, I think it's not just a choice between coconut and uh, palm oil. I think you have to broaden your choice to actually looking back to what has traditionally been uh, planted in terms of um, um, uh, vegetation across that uh, part of uh, the Pulangi River. Uh, we have actually worked with uh, young people in um, in communities um, uh, in the Sidio River Basin to actually try to rediscover indigenous plants and indigenous trees uh, that would uh, thrive in in those regions. Uh, and they have actually been able to um, begin to develop uh, nurseries for hundreds of species of um, plants that have um, uh, not been um, explored anymore. Uh, they've, in, in some communities, they've lost them. Uh, in some communities, they're actually uh, replanting them. So I'll, I'll tell you a very specific um, uh, plant that is now being re- uh, restored uh, in a particular com uh, com community of um, 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 uh, Manobos uh, in in uh, in Bukidnon, uh, and this is the indigenous cotton. So apparently, um, there is indigenous cotton that have been planted by indigenous communities in uh, northern Mindanao that have been used for their, um, for their uh, traditional clothes and traditional weaving. Uh, but this has been lost through many um, you know, initiatives to actually plant different kinds of agricultural products from um, you know, exotic trees like Jemelina and Falcata to um, uh, value-added crops like uh, cassava uh, and so on. Uh, um, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, um, a pineapple, uh, but now this community is actually has rediscovered that they actually have a weaving practice, not just uh, uh, not just um, buying clothes uh, from uh, from outside, but they do have a weaving practice that they have traditionally had, but they, they also have traditional cotton. And, and it was lucky that an, an old an, a, a mother of the community leader have actually set aside seeds uh, from uh, traditional cotton. So they're using this to plant uh, indigenous cotton now in, in Bukidnon. And the demand now for indigenous cotton is actually extensive uh, in, in, in the Philippines. Uh, and... Uh, uh, we uh, and they actually have a uh, request for indigenous cottons from all the way uh, from Batangas uh, to um, uh, to uh, the Cordilleras, where um, a, uh, you know indigenous cotton have disappeared. So there is an opportunity to rediscover indigenous plants that have been used, uh, you know, before uh, oil palm and coconut came into the picture. I'll have the floor, please. 